Yes, gentlemen, that orange. I had uh, two questions. Can you talk about how you conceived the opening of the show with Don's long walk and ending up in the phone booth? <laughs> and secondly, any uh, good stories behind one, one of my favorite episodes, which I think was a two-parter, when Don Rickles uh, guessed <laughs> <on. laughs> Well, I didn't get all of that. <laughs> I can I answer. Mr. Part after you say, here's my question. <laughs> <laughs> I did hear Don Rickles, though. <laughs> I can answer the first part. I just, we needed an opening, and it occurred to me that this would be interesting, and I just sat down and wrote it, and then because we needed it, send it in immediately, uh, I, I shot it as well. Um, and I got a great deal of encouragement uh, from uh, Buck Henry, who felt it was uh, surreal. And that was, a, that's nice, that's a very uh, <laughs> rich sounding word. We're doing something surrealistic on the show. And he loved it, and it was so right. And we figured, well, we'll replace it. And generally shows change their openings after a number of years, but this became, such a, a signature that it remained that way throughout uh, all of our years. And I remember we were concerned because there was no hole on the floor under the phone booth. Oh, yes. Yeah. And so, you know, we weren't sure it was going to work, and Don said, don't worry about it. And he just dropped. He, he, he just <laughs> dropped right below it. Yeah, we were figuring on really cutting a hole oh, in the, the floor, floor <laughs> stage. <laughs> Talking about Rickles, he, every time he did a show, and he did a few of them, it would have to be a two-parter. <laughs> because the first show would be over budget, <laughs> overdone, because we were laughing. We, we spent the whole day laughing at each other. I remember one time uh, we were captured by chaos and we were in a cellar and we were chained to the wall. <laughs> and there was the villain, the chaos villain was the, called the maestro because he led a symphony orchestra. And he played it kind of on the gay side. And he would say, and now, when this music goes off, this cannon, and a gigantic <laughs> cannon comes out of the opposite wall, he said, will go off and you will be blown to bits. And I said, are you kidding? I said, if that cannon goes off, the cops and the Marines will come rolling in here like oranges. And he said, not if I use this. And he reaches down and puts on a gigantic silence. <laughs> Our Rickles and I are hysterical. <laughs> we are on the wall, chained to the wall. And the line I'm supposed to say is, that's the second biggest silencer I ever seen. <laughs> We couldn't get the line out. We kept laughing, laughing, laughing. Jimmy Comac was directing the show. And after we laughed away about $2 million, <laughs> what they did was they left the stage, everybody. They turned out the lights, and they closed the doors of the stage and left Rickles and I <laughs> time to the world. Fifteen minutes, they opened the door, slid it open, and what they heard was the laughter. <laughs> <laughs> so finally, in frustration, Jimmy Comac said, all right, send Adams to his dressing room, we'll take a single of Rickles. <laughs> then send Rickles to his dressing room, we'll take a single of Don. It's the only way that we could get it done. <laughs> I had so much fun with him. He's such a funny man. And I loved it when he comes as my... Uh, army buddy. He doesn't know I'm a spy. And the nets start falling and <laughs> all the gimmicks start. And I'm talking into the shoe. And he's going. And we make a date with the girls. And he says, Max, do me a favor. When we go out with the girls tonight, don't talk into the shoe. <laughs> 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 